Hi everyone, I'm Mary Lin. Uh, I'm a second year PhD, to, uh, PhD student in University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Today I have a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Burich as a today's speaker in Planter Talk of 2019 Gem Workshop. Currently, Dr. Catherine Gurich holds a postdoc research position at the Space Science Laboratory at Berkeley, California. Dr. Gurich holds a bachelor degree in physics from the Boston University. She was advised by Professor Robert Ergen and obtained a PhD degree in space physics from astrophysical and planetary science at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Her dissertation thesis is titled Kinetic Electric Field Signatures Associated with Magnetic Turbulence and Their Impact on Space Plasma Environments. Her previous research included anal analysis of structures such as electron or ion phase space holes, double layers, and small scale magnetic holes in a terrestrial magneto tail. Dr. Gurich's research focused on small scale plasma structures and wave particle interaction associated with magnetic turbulence in the terrestrial magnetosphere, especially the generation and influence of electrostatic waves in collisionless shock environments. Today, Dr. Gurich is here to present particle heating and thermalization in collisionless shocks in the MMS era. She is going to talk about the terrestrial pole shock in particular, how particles are slowed and heated within the shock itself. Please join me in welcome Dr. Gurich. Thank you, that was such a nice introduction. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, the GEM community uh, brought my father a lot of joy during his life, so it's a particular honor for me to contribute to that same community today. So today, I'm going to be advertising our new focus group, Particle Heating and Thermalization in Collisionless Shocks in the MMS Era. And that's a lot of words to kind of throw together, so I wanted to really bring it down to the basics. So my first slide is, what exactly is a shock? Uh, and I think that's shown very beautifully by this picture of a bullet traveling through air. Essentially, you have a supersonic flow that encounters an obstacle, and that creates this shock wave that can extend far past the obstacle itself. So in essence, a shock wave is a discontinuous uh, change in pressure, temperature, and density. And its main function is to slow that supersonic flow so it can move past the obstacle. In breaking it down to its bare components, it converts kinetic energy into thermal energy. And there are two types of shocks, collisional shocks and collisionless shocks. Collisional shocks are generally more straightforward. You can convert kinetic energy through particle, uh, to thermal energy through particle collisions. You have particles that collide with the obstacle and go back into the upstream flow, collide with those particles, bounce back and forth, and that's how they become heated and this discontinuity or shock is formed. Collision shocks are much more complicated. We're not really sure what the dominant mechanisms are. We know what mechanisms occur in collision with shocks like turbulence, particle re reflection, other nonlinear processes, dispersive radiation, and others. So shocks are very prevalent through space plasma, so it's, very, it's a very important process. You see it in astrospheres, maybe. IBEX might have debunked <coughs> that theory. You see it in supernova, galactic jets, and most importantly, planets, which is what this community is very much interested in, because Earth is technically a planet. <laughs> <laughs> and the Earth's star shock is a collisionless, um, a, a collisionless discontinuity. So here's a general overview of how the solar wind interacts with the magnetosphere. You have the solar wind, which is supersonic, um, encountering the obstacle that is the Earth's magnetosphere. And that forms a bow shock, which heats the solar wind and slows it down and creates the magnetosheath plasma. 
and the magnetoplasma is diverted around the magnetosphere and also interacts with the magnetopause, which is the barrier or the outer barrier of the Earth's magnetosphere. And it's that magnetosheath plasma and the interaction with the magnetopause that causes reconnection, Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities that can uh, cascade into uh, generating aurora and contributing to the radiation belts. So in the whole dance of solar wind magnetosphere interaction, the bow shock is the first barrier or the fir and therefore a vital player in the solar wind magnetosphere interaction. Now I say that the bow shock is a barrier, but it's more of a living, breathing thing. It's macrostructure, macro that word is always hard for some reason. The macrostructure of the bow shock is a very complex and constantly evolving thing. And it's very, the actual structure of the shock itself is very dependent on upstream solar wind conditions, uh, particularly the direction of the interplanetary magnetic field. If you have uh, the, IMF perpendicular to the shock normal, you have what's called a quasi-perpendicular bow shock. And that's generally more clean, it's a more classic uh, representation of a, a compressive shock or a uh, discontinuation or uh, discontinuous, discontinuous change in pressure, temperature, and density. If you have the, mag the IMF more parallel to the shock normal, you have a much messier picture. You have the you have much more um, extended reflected po oh, excuse me uh, populations that that can create uh, extended foreshock regions. You have very turbulent magnetic fields, and those foreshock regions that I mentioned before can also create their own dynamics and have their own transients like foreshock bubbles, hot flow anomalies, which have their own very interesting physics um, associated with them, which we're not going to talk about in detail today, but I hope we get into it in the focus group. Um, so, so the whole structure of the, of the bow shock can be very varied, and what's more, the upstream conditions that govern those, uh, that structure is constantly changing. In the simulation, you can have a quasi-perpendicular shock one second, then the IMF can change, and quasi-perpendicular, uh, quasi-parallel the next. And what's very interesting is, depending on the conditions um, and the structure of the bow shock, the inner magnetosphere structure can change very str um, strongly. So I hope I emphasize how many different physics are happening within this breathing barrier. So again, the overarching question of how is kinetic energy converted to thermal energy that's a very complicated thing, or a very complicated question to answer for the uh, terrestrial bow shock. Now, we've been able to understand the macro structure of the bow shock um, over a long period of time with many different um, observational missions. We have, have data from ICE, WIND, Cluster, Themis, amongst others. And uh, these spacecraft were launched as early as 1977. So we have decades and decades of data. And we've had, we've devoted countless man hours to analyzing this data and understanding the global structure of the data shock. But ultimately we've been somewhat limited in terms of actually understanding the physics within the shock itself. And the reason why is the shock or the discontinuity is actually very hard to observe. What we usually uh, do with uh, historical measurements is uh, measure the upstream and downstream conditions, apply the ranking Huguenot conditions, which is just the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, and from there we can uh, kind of estimate what happens inside the shock. But actually observing the shock itself, usually you observe it on the order of seconds. So, and uh, particle instruments uh, historically have had a time resolution of about three or single to tens of seconds of, res of time resolution. So to give you kind of an idea of what this looks like, I'm showing you an example of a bash shot crossing observed by the Themis spacecraft. So this is approximately 80 minutes of data. I'm showing you magnetic fields, electrons, ions, ion velocity, and density. So you, excuse me. So we observed the magnetosheath over on the left here quite a bit, and then we observed the 
upstream solar wind or foreshock area for the rest of the time. But the shock is right here. These few data points, um, right almost to the, to the left. So for, three, for a three second particle time resolution, you only really get a few points of data. You don't really get a great understanding of what's happening within the actual shock. So historically, we've had to rely on electric fields and magnetic field measurements to really uh, theorize how the inner you know, workings of the shock uh, work. And one uh, theory is th through, and one very prevalent and robust theory is the cross shock potential, which is shown uh, by quasi-static or DC electric fields. And it's this, in this theory that the shock has a non-zero potential, which interacts with the particles in two different ways. For ions, it actually reflects uh, reflects the ions back into the upstream, and they have to gain speed coming back around and to encounter the shock. And this keeps happening again and again until the ions pick enough speed to go right through the potential. For the electrons, they just accelerate them right through the shock, and this creates a hole in the in their phase space distribution. Which, is, which can generate waves, which scatter the electrons, creating a more flat-topped or thermalized distribution, effectively heating them. The only problem is these are fairly difficult to observe the, due to the constantly changing or dynamic nature of the shock itself. It's very hard to actually find a stable shock potential to observe. The waves are also uh, of particular interest to the shock community because there are a lot of them. We have seen ion acoustic waves, Whistler mode waves, electrostatic solitary waves, and uh, electron bursting waves, or waves from the electron cyclotron drift. And these happen on the order of tens to hundreds of milliseconds. And it's really not clear how or why they're generated. We can theoretically connect them to micro instabilities like the Budeman instability. I already mentioned the electron cyclotron drift instability, uh, the two stream instability, and there are many others that I that I could list. But uh, but essentially, uh, again, since our due to our limited particle observation, we we're not really sure how uh, we can make all the theories we want, but we're not quite sure how they're generated. And what's more. These waves are actually very powerful. They can they can have amplitudes for over 100 millivolts per meter. I've even seen some that go to 1,000 millivolts per meter. These are, have a lot of power associated with them. So how they influence the shock is also not clear because we haven't again been able to observe how the particles are affected by them. So enter uh, the last uh, component of this, the magnetospheric multiscale mission. And I'm sure most of you know this mission, but uh, it's a four spacecraft mission whose objective is to observe magnetic reconnection in the magnetosphere, particularly the electron dynamics associated with magnetic reconnection. And it's, in order to observe the, those electron dynamics, it was designed to have a very small spatial separation and very high time uh, resolution particle instruments where it's able to observe uh, electrons at a 30 millisecond time cadence and ions at 150 millisecond time cadence. And what's even better for us is that it's crossed the bow shock hundreds of times, which makes it a great observer of microscale processes in the terrestrial bow shock. So, here I'm going to um, be a little dramatic and bring you back to the example I showed you before with 80 minutes of uh, Venice data. Here is an example of two shock crossings from the MMS uh, data, from the MMS uh, data set. And this is over nine minutes of data, and you can already see all this intricate structure in the in the ion uh, spectra. And what's more, it has full, full uh, magnetic field and electric field capabilities, and we've already observed, uh, again, a zoo of, of uh, wave measurements. Electromagnetic whistler waves, magnetosonic whistler waves, uh, electrostatic wave modes, uh, many of which I've already stated, uh, that can go to very, very high amplitudes. So now we can actually dig in and really look at how these waves interact with the plasma environments around them. 
and the MMS community has already made a number of different observations regarding, uh, regarding shock physics. And I want you to come to this session, so I'm not going to go too much into this, but I want to give you a, a teaser of what will be, will be discussed in this bunch of set, sessions. First, we observe quasi-static electric fields. This is by Li Jian Chen. And here are the electron distributions associated with this quasi-static electric fields that represents the uh, cross-shock potential. And you can actually see the electrons evolving over time within those th 30 millisecond steps. So before, when you could only see the beginning and the after effects of the electron uh, heating, you can actually see the process now, which is a very exciting, uh, exciting uh, thing to see. We also see a unexpected influence of waves. Here um, from my paper, we see um, ion acoustic waves associated with these variations in electric, oh, sorry, excuse me, um, in the, the reflected ion populations here. You see all these bumps here that, again, change over 150 milliseconds. And we believe that this is um, indicative of reflected ion beams that are constantly being in, um, injected into the reflected population. So again, this kind of emphasizes how we can relate particles to the waves themselves in the bow shock now. Another thing that we see is that even these really tiny um, electros electrostatic solitary waves that can last, that are observed for a few milliseconds, could possibly effectively scatter electrons in their path very efficiently. And this is by Ivan Bosco. And another slightly unexpected thing that we see is magnetic reconnection in the shock re in the actual shock region itself. So that's also a very interesting um, microscale process that we we can observe now within the, the shock environment. So okay, I've shown you a lot of things already. So let's get back to the overarching question that we all want to answer in regards to shocks. How do shocks? convert kinetic energy into thermal energy? And this is a question that we've really been wondering for decades. And we've been limited due to, we haven't been actually able to observe the, on, on a particle scale what the, what the shock um, is doing. And now with over hundreds of bow shock crossings from the, M, from the MMS spacecraft, which can actually start uh, looking into these microscale processes, we can start the next steps into really understanding shock physics. And while we've had a few answers provided to us by this data set, it actually just created way more questions for us to answer. And that's why we need your help here to help answer these questions and to help understand what actually is going on. So here are our goals for the, our um, Bashock focus group. We'd like to address the structure uh, of quasi-static electric fields associated with the cross-shock potential, understand what the waves are in the uh, collisionless shock environment and how they're generated, and we'd like to quantify how efficient are these two things at thermalizing particles. Does one outweigh the other, or do they work in perfect unison? And by addressing these questions, we hope to enable advances in MHD hybrid and PIC simulations to model the Earth's bow shock and create a better understanding of how this affects our entire solar wind magnetosphere interaction process as a whole. So you've already met me, but uh, my other focus group chairs are Lynn Wilson and Lee Jin Chen from the Goddard Space Flight Center, and Yvonne Bosco, from, uh, also from the Space Sciences Lab. We're all very nice people. Please come <laughs> talk to us if you have any questions related to shocks or shock or um, closing with shock dynamics. And here is the schedule and, lo and locations as to where we'll be discussing these topics. And I'm just going to leave this, this up while you get to while I answer some questions.
to a little bit on that side of uh, reconnection happening in these uh, in these shocks. I guess, do you have a sense yet from the MMS data whether this is uh, kind of the type of global reconnection structure we might picture, say, a magneto pause, where you imagine these relatively large-scale uh, ion jets going in both directions, or do you think this is more of like a turbulent reconnection process or this electron-only reconnection stuff happening? I don't know if you have a sense of the scale of, of these things yet. So I think Sean could answer that a lot better than I could, but I think I will make the comments of, I think it, I, and Sean, I, I don't know where you are, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's more electron scale um, type of reconnection that happens with turbulent environments. But uh, I think we'll be talking about that at length in our splinter session. So you should come and hear, hear from someone more knowledgeable than I. Um, an interesting thing to bring up though is I, I believe from uh, Imogen Jinjel's paper that is that you're, they're due to the constantly changing nature of the shock. It, it's really difficult. I feel like it happens on a very, very short time scale. So the conditions of the shock actually quench uh, conditions for reconnection very quickly. Okay, there are no more questions. Thank you very much, Katie, for an excellent talk. Thank you.